Welcome to Law Sessions. I am Jennifer Housen. In this law session, we will focus on answering public law examination questions. Now, this session assumes knowledge of the syllabus and it also assumes that you have either watched all the law session videos in the series or that you have completed your reading of the syllabus. Now, because the entire session is focused on how you approach and answer public law questions. I will therefore assume that you have gone through and done your reading. Now, in the first of the four segments, and in this first few minutes, we will consider a general approach to answering exam questions. In the following three segments, we will dissect a specific public law question. Now, the three areas that I have chosen for us to, of course, consider by way of looking at answering a question are the areas of constitutions generally, parliamentary sovereignty, and the Human Rights Act. Now, public law exams tend to be predominantly essays. That is not to say that you wouldn't get a problem question, for example, because there are certain areas, for example, electoral law, as well as judicial review, which do lend themselves to problem scenarios, and you may very well, of course, get a question like that. The questions I will use are real questions, which are taken from the University of London External LLB Programme in 2011. I will focus on three essay type questions, but certainly if you are signed up to a premium service, I will certainly, of course, uh, go through problem type questions with you. Now, I have personally assisted hundreds of persons with examination preparations, not only for their LLB exams, but also for the New York bar exams, for law school entrance exams, and having completed my own LLB and postgraduate diploma in law in the UK, and having sat the New York bar exams and completed my professional qualifications in the Caribbean, I can say to you with some degree of confidence that assignment and exam writing is something with which I am well familiar. So, as far as you're concerned, you are in somewhat fairly safe hands. Now, it doesn't matter how many hours you have spent studying and revising, the law examiner is completely unaware of that. What happens is the examiner, unless he's your tutor or unless uh, he's somebody with which you're fairly familiar, he will only meet you one time for three hours on paper and you have got to make it count. Meaning, the only time you and him get in con contact is when he sets your exam that you're sitting and writing. Now, the two biggest criticisms of law exam candidates are firstly, that they do not answer the exam question, and the second is that they display poor time management. Well, as it relates to not answering the exam question, the examiner, of course, will say that the law student did not answer the exam question. The law student, of course, will say, of course I did. As far as the law student is concerned, they have just come out of a three-hour exam and they wrote for three hours, be that as it may. So as far as they're concerned, I must have answered the question. Well, both the law student, you, and the examiner are right. The law student did answer the exam question. It's just that you did not answer the exam question that the examiner asked. What do I mean by that? Well, there is the exam question asked by the examiner and there's the exam answer given by the examinee. Now, interestingly, there is a book called Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And the title might as well be Law Examiners Are From Mars and Law Examinees Are From Venus. Because if I had a dollar for every time a law student says to me, I don't know how I failed public law. I felt really good after the exam. All of the topics that I had prepared for were on the exam paper. In fact, I thought I'd failed some other topic, tort, for example, but I got a 60 in that. Well, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that, then I would indeed be a very rich woman. The point is, of course, that an examiner will ask a specific question on the paper. And the question, for example, might say, critically assess the current law 
relating to the composition and powers of the House of Lords. Yeah? Critically assess the, currently, the current law relating to the composition and powers of the House of Lords. Well, that is the question the examiner has asked. What the law student reads is, what is everything I can write that I possibly remember on the topic of House of Lords and write it down in 45 minutes? And they answer that question that they're thinking. And they briefly mention, if at all, the composition of the House of Lords and briefly mention, if at all, and sometimes completely ignore the bit that says, assess the current law or powers of the House of Lords. Now, I must admit that sometimes the exam question is written as if the exam writer is indeed from Mars and living in some parallel universe in his own head. But if you read the question carefully, it does actually make sense. What you need to do is to consider the question as a legal hypothesis and dissect it for legal principles. Now, if for example, it is a problem question, do not try to visualize the characters as actual persons and the situations as something which is real life. It is not. It is a hypothetical situation constructed to encapsulate legal principles for you, the law student, to identify in context and answer it. Now, as to the second criticism of poor time management, I want you to understand the significance of poor time management. If you have four questions to complete in three hours and you decide to do two to the best of your ability, well, you don't need to be a mathematician to realize that even if you wrote each of those two answers to the extent that it is worthy of a law lord, you simply cannot get more than 25% of the entirety of the marks for each question. So you cannot get more than 50% of the available marks. So by doing two questions, you're already setting yourself up to get a reduced percentage of the entire available marks. So if you can address these two main criticisms, you are more than halfway there. So if we start with the latter first, how do you deal with time management? Well, one of the biggest mistakes I see law students make is to spend hours and hours reading law books. I will say this, I have never met the law student who didn't have the knowledge and powers, but I have certainly met a lot of law students who have had the knowledge and failed. Because when I say they make a mistake in reading a lot, that is not to say you're not to read a lot. But what it does say is that you need to balance the reading with writing. Because the knowledge alone is not enough. The primary piece of advice that I will give you about time management is this. If the first time that you are writing under timed conditions is in the exam, you have already failed yourself. Because in your preparation, what you need to do is to ensure that you write out in full at least one question to a past exam question from your university and write it at least once under timed conditions. Now, if you are sitting an examination of three hours in which you are required to write four questions, then you have 45 minutes per question. But that does not translate to 45 minutes writing time. You will need at least about five minutes to prepare the question, make your notes, and you'll need about five minutes to reread the question. Yes, you need to reread the question because sometimes your brain is going fast quicker or at a faster pace than you can write. And so sometimes you might lose something which is very important. And it is when you come back to reread, you see the importance of having left out, let's say, not or may or is, and so I would urge you to reread. So, effectively, you have 35 minutes of writing time. Before you go into the exam, you should know exactly what 35 minutes of your writing looks like and feels like. So some examinees will ask me, how much should I write? Do I write six pages, seven pages, what do I do? Well, you need to be able to write 35 minutes worth of an answer. So if you practice and you know 
that a topic which you are extremely familiar with and which you have prepared and done the reading and looked at the question and when you sit down without books and you write six sides of an A4 sheet, for example, then you know that is the very best that you can do and therefore in an exam, the absolute best you can do if you knew the topic and were very well prepared is six sides. So after you've written, say, four sides of a paper, you keep an eye on the clock to make sure you are on target time-wise. Now, that's your time management. What about your question answering ability? Well, first, if it's an essay question, make sure you read it at least twice. I would say read it four times because you have to read it with sort of the intonations. Yes? So it's looking at assessing the House of Lords. What do you, And you read it so that it makes sense to you and you see what the examiner is asking in the question. Then you consider what is the exa examiner asking me? See, they do not, the examiner does not just want a parliamentary sovereign answer or a rule of law answer. You need to look at what exactly about parliamentary sovereignty or, for example, what exactly about rule of law the examiner is asking you. Then you answer the question logically, meaning you start with a path. Then you go to a definition, or you can start with a definition and then go down a path. What I mean is, when I talk about a path, where do you stand in respect of the statement? Is it that you're going to lean in favor of the statement? Is it that you are going to say the statement is inaccurate? Because most questions are not, especially essay questions, they're generally half-truths. They're generally slightly inaccurate statements. And so you have to then say, well, do you agree with it or not? So you show the examiner where you're going. And then if it is, for example, it says, you know, uh, parliamentary sovereignty has been uh, completely uh, been done away with in light of the EU, you have to look at whether or not parliamentary sovereignty has indeed been of no substance in recent times. And then, of course, you need to define parliamentary sovereignty and so on. So you state your path, you define, or... Based on your writing style, you can define parliamentary sovereignty and then say where you're going with your discussion. You then set out your arguments in favor of the position you're going to advance, the arguments against the position that you're advancing, and then you conclude. Now, your conclusion is not a rehash of everything you said. It's a pulling together of your arguments. Now, one of the ways to stay focused in an essay question, keep referring to the words used in the question then it means that you're answering that question, that exam question asked by the examiner and not just a general sovereignty question or a rule of law question, which is a general everything I know about sovereignty or rule of law type of answer. Now, in an essay, read the question carefully to make sure you understand what is required. Look carefully at the keywords. Look at the phrases which indicate the sort of answer you're expected to give. You're really going to find essays which require you to simply state factually or simply describe what the law is. You will almost always be required to analyze the factual content in some way, usually highlighting any problems or gaps in the law, any suggested possible reforms. Now, if a question asks you to analyze the current law relating to the composition and powers of the House of Lords, you should not write everything you know about the House of Lords in a descriptive fashion and finish with one sentence saying that, therefore, this shows the law relating to the composition and the power of the House of Lords, etc., etc. Repeat in the question as the last line of your answer does not fool anyone and it certainly doesn't fool the examiner and it doesn't make it a conclusion. Instead, you should select your relevant material uh, and, your, and in your whole answer and target it given an analysis of the current law as it relates to the composition and powers of the House of Lords. So for example, looking at the relevant statutes which have impacted, example, the Parliaments Act 1911, the Parliaments Act 1949, the Two Peerages Act, and of course the 1999 House of Lords Act. Now just because you have read a whole side of stuff to do with House of Lords, doesn't mean the examiner wants it. You have to be discerning. So even if you know everything about House of Lords reforms, you need to put that knowledge 
in context of the questions asked. Now, what about problem questions? Well, as I say, these are generally not uh, you know, replete in, in respect of public law exam papers, but nevertheless, you need to know. Generally, it will ask you to advise somebody. There will be a factual situations. It sets out certain rules. Uh, and what you need to know in respect of problems are the rules of issues, rules, application, and conclusion, meaning you IRAC it. Now, in some jurisdictions or in some law schools in America, they talk about CLIO, which is the same thing. You look at the claim, the law, you are evaluated, and then you look at the outcome. And what that means really is that the structure of your answer, so you don't need to subhead issue rule, don't do that. What you need to do is when someone is reading your answer, the structure of it should show that you flagged up what the issue is, you flagged up what the law is, and there's an application, and you've given an outcome based on the facts there. So you can generally identify the problem questions by uh, the hypothetical given. Again, I would urge you, don't visualize these as real things and real persons. Legal writing is about formality. What is your name? It is not Jennifer. What is your name? My name is Jennifer Housen. When you're writing, if the examiner says advise X, you start off in advising X, it is necessary to, and you carry on. So be a bit formal about it. Now, there's an American TV program called Jeopardy. And the idea behind it is that you're given an answer and you have to phrase the question. So, for example, the host will say Queen Elizabeth II and the contestant says, who is the Queen of England? Well, your answer should reflect something like that. When you read the first line, the first paragraph, the first two paragraphs, somebody should be able to know what the question was. The problem sometimes is that when law students complete their writing, you're wondering what are they answering because they've given such a general discussion, let's say about parliamentary sovereignty, that it is just writing a text. Now, don't do that. Your problem questions should be focused and they should answer the question asked. We're going to take a short break now and on my return, I will review the first of three questions and as I say, immediately after the break, I'm going to start with looking at a question relating to constitutions generally. <laughs> 